This way David can turn, you know, to both sides. Both sides. And people watching him on camera would think that, you know, it's more of uh, a... Okay. Um, I did fill you in on some of the, the good news. Um, one piece of information we talked about briefly is uh, uh, August we have a, a family camping trip, so I wasn't sure how we're going to handle church. And I was thinking about doing a live stream from up there, and, and I'm very apprehensive about that because I don't know if I'll get signal enough to do a live stream in the middle of nowhere up in the mountains. So it's, it was extremely frustrating because I don't want to close the door. We're, you know, we're just starting to see new faces and we don't want to uh, put ourselves in that position. So on the way to church this morning, I thought to myself, you know, we're paying for the space anyway. Why can't I, instead of doing a 10 o'clock service, why can't I do a 6 o'clock service? So after uh, service today, while I'm uploading today's sermon, I will email Zach and find out if we can do a 6 p.m. service. Uh, but I think that's a viable solution to that problem. Uh, I will send out uh, a massive uh, marketing campaign on that. And you never know, God willing, that could turn into an evening service for us. Even if I have three or four people, just like I do now, I have three or four new faces that will be coming to church and hearing the gospel. So there might be an opportunity there. So on August 13th, uh, there won't be a 10 a.m. service. Provided that Zach is uh, willing to work with me, we'll probably have a 6 p.m. soon. Um, and again, there's another opportunity. You may know people that have plans during the morning, and you can invite them to church. Um, this week, I'm going to order materials for our uh, open house and our uh, soul winning uh, door knocking we're going to be doing in the month of September. Um, that uh, day is scheduled for the open house October 2nd at 6.30. It will be a Monday evening. Uh, hopefully we can get some more people to come because Wednesday night seems to be a little difficult for a lot of folks. Uh, in addition to that, that particular piece of uh, material that we're getting is going to be multiple uses for it. We're going to be using it for a Solony track. On one side we're going to have the Romans Road on there. Uh, on the other side is going to be two invites. One, a call to come to fellowship. And two, uh, the obviously the open house meet and greet on October 2nd. So we need to be pushing uh, people to come to church. I mean, they need to hear the gospel. Of course, a, a open house is a little bit less uh, intrusive. Uh, it's worked for a lot of church planners to bring people into a neutral environment to get to learn about a church learn the church history, uh, and decide if that's the family they want to be a part of. So it's worked for a long time um, to do an open house like that. Uh, they're the church planning ministry that that's all they do. They go from town to town. They do the soul winning. They invite people to an open house meet and greet just like we are doing. And that's, incidentally, that's where I got the idea from, and it's worked for me. So I'm trying to combine as much of, of, of uh, what I've learned into one packet can uh, stir the community uh, and of course in the end it's really about God and he does all um, Monique Delphin contacted me again asked me if we we're going to be doing any more work uh, I said our major focus right now is soul winning so uh, she is uh, going to be coming out likely to help us uh, and uh, she may bring her brothers and sisters. Um, now, the other thing I want to talk about is I want to do more than just a Saturday morning. So in September, I'm probably going to do a Tuesday night as well. Coming out here, doing door knocking. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can put out a few hundred uh, invites uh, and meet with a few hundred people. God willing, we have the ability to do so. Uh, the last go around, we did a couple hundred, right? Uh, maybe we, we met with 100 of those people, half, 75, uh, 75 to 100 people that we've actually spoken to last go around. Uh, 
so hopefully we can touch more people. Um, it, you know, Baptists are about the numbers, so the more people we can see and, and share the gospel with, uh, the more people will bring you to Christ. And what else do I have to cover this morning? Um, oh, Thursday nights, the Chamber of Commerce has a chamber mixer. I've been wanting to attend this, and I think I just, uh, not th every Thursday night, but the third Thursday of every month. So I think starting next month, I'm gonna have to schedule that for myself to attend it so the community people that are, are going to these Chamber of Commerce meetings will get to know that there's a church inside the cafeteria at the high school. There's a lot of people that don't know we're here. Um, and uh, next Sunday, we are, are taking up the collection for Solomon Tepa. Um, the Keens have put in their, uh, I haven't yet, uh, but the Keens have already put in their contribution for Solomon to get this rolling. Um, and I think that covers everything. Oh, I'm going to send out an email on the materials that I'm ordering for our soul winning. Uh, I'll probably have to get with you separately because you don't have email. Uh, make sure that everybody sees what it is and uh, if you have any input, please do. So I'll probably uh, send out some copies of the samples and uh, meet with you if you want to be involved in it. Uh, today's sermon, we're going to take a uh, short break from uh, Genesis because there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on in the fellowship. There's a lot going on with the brothers and sisters. And I need to make sure that everybody's strong and their hearts are looking towards God. And uh, I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page and their passion is for Jesus Christ. You don't stray. God has put pastors in a position to shepherd while he is not physically here in guiding the sheep and making sure that they don't stray. Even in their, their personal lives and their minds and their hearts, it's necessary that we are close. It's necessary. So I'm going to be reading from 1 John. 1 John 1, verses 5 through 10. Turn there with me. First John 1, verses 5 through 10. It's just before Revelation. First John 1. They're short books, so they'll be classed very close together. all together? All right. First John 1, verse 5 through 10. This then is the message which we heard of him and declared unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us all from sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now I'm going to go through that again break it down and unwrap the text. Verse 5, this is then the message which we have heard from him and declare it to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. When darkness comes, whose light do we turn to? And the light needs to be in us if we be a new creature of him. His light shines through us. John 12, 46 says, I come 
a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Now there's a lot of people out there that I'm hoping that you're watching today. I love you dearly, but you're walking in darkness. You have to believe. Belief and faith are gifts for by grace ye are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James 1, 17, if light is of him, we need to go to him to have that light. I know a lot of you out there that are watching this, I'm hoping that you're still watching our sermons. Take heed because... If you decided that it's a good idea to try smoking again, going out to the bar, drinking again, you're straying. If you haven't been to church, this whole movement of let's be in a little house or, or in a little group, or if you're not doing that at all and you're thinking that it's okay, well, the next section that we're going to get into is going to refute that. You need fellowship, and you need fellowship within the church. Verse 6, And if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in the darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Fellowship with God. Fellowship. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not know the truth. How do you have fellowship with God? We're two or more gathered. We've heard that before, right? Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do, forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a matter of some, but as exhorting one another, and so much more as we ye see the day approaching. We need to be together. If we're watching the world come down and crumble, as prophecy has already stated, and the world is coming to a close, as prophecy has stated, we need one another. And you're not going to find it in a bar. You're not going to find it smoking with your friends. You're not going to find it uh, hanging out uh, in, in lascivious places. You need to be with brothers and sisters. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. You know, if I spend time with people that want to talk to me about what's on football this, this Sunday, or what that lady was wearing, or what have you, and, and whose motorcycle, or what have you, back in the day, that was the people I associated with, I would not be right with God. I would be spending time in the darkness. I wouldn't be able to be sharp in the Word and be able to lift up my brothers and sisters. Instead, I would be giving you a sissified gospel. A sissified gospel means that, oh, it's okay. Christ died for our sins. So we can sin. No. And Paul goes on to say in that passage, God forbid. We have a, a habit of reading scripture and then just saying, all right, well, this is where we're going to hang on to and then we're going to forget the stuff around it. One of my favorites is, judge not unless ye be judged. That whole passage in Matthew 7 is followed by explaining that righteous judgment is what we're made for. Paul goes on to reiterate that later. I can do a whole sermon on things that Christians tend to take out of context. 1 John 1 3 says, If we fellowship with one with another, we also fellowship with God. Because he is here. Can't get any clearer than that. The truth. Next portion of that particular verse. The truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. And he needs to be in us. Prayer is mentioned 650 times in the Bible. 450 of them are recorded prayers, the details of. 
To pray is mentioned 258 times in the New Testament and 68 times in the Old Testament. That's over 300 times. Just the word prayer. Excuse me, pray. Let me take that back. Just the word pray. Prayer is mentioned 650 times. 450 are recorded prayers. To pray is mentioned 258 times and 68 times in uh, uh, the New Testament, over 300 times altogether. Incidentally, you also need to be aware that there are modern perversions like the NAV, NIV, and RSV will list the number of prayers dramatically different. I'll give you those right now. NAV 57 and 52, very different from 258 and 68. NIV 48 and 73. And RSV 61 and 61. That's a little weird. Both of them are the same. Sounds like something got lazy. But the bottom line is the King James has 258 times total in the New Testament and 68. The Old Testament is over 300 times. How many times a day did Jesus pray? If he says to pray without ceasing, then likely that's what he was doing. However, the, the record recorded number of times is, is starting with the 40 days he, he, he prayed in the desert, plus an additional 25 times to the synoptic gospel. How important is prayer if God praying that much while he's on the earth. That's not including the other 30 some odd years that he was on the earth prior to his ministry. We don't know, that's not recorded. Just in the period of, of the three years he was ministering. This is what's recorded. Paul mentions prayer 41 times. The Bible lists nine types of prayer that you can pray if you don't know what to pray. Prayer of faith in James 5.15. Go ahead and write it down. Prayer of faith in James 5.15. Prayer of agreement. This is corporate prayer. This is what we do at church. Acts 2.42. Prayer of request of, uh, in Philippians 4.6. Prayer of thanksgiving in 95. Psalm 95, 2 through 3. Prayer of worship in Acts 13, 2 through 3. Prayer of consecration in Matthew 26, 39. Prayer of intercession in 1 Timothy 2, 1. Prayer in spirit, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15. Would you like me to repeat those? Yes? Okay. First being prayer of faith in James 5, 15. Agreement, prayer of agreement in Acts 2.42. Prayer for request in Philippians 4.6. Prayer for thanksgiving in Psalm 95, 2 through 3. Prayer of worship in Acts 13, 2 through 3. Prayer of consecration in Matthew 26, 39. Prayer of intercession, 1 Timothy 2, 1. Prayer in spirit, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15. Now, how many of you notice something missing? John 17? No. We didn't pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you immensely, Lord, for the blessing of being able to come together and fellowship in your name. Lord, I hope that this service is simply to edify is simply to glorify you strengthen our fellowship we have members who are struggling with health issues even your stewards Lord guide us 
Lord, guide the message. Pray this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Prayer is necessary. How many of you forget to pray? We just saw that. We can forget to pray because we get up late in the morning. We can forget to pray because it, it, we've just got finished with work and we're tired or exhausted. We can forget to pray for many reasons. Anywhere in the Bible that starts out, Oh God, in the text is prayer. Go we'll back into Gen Genesis and see that. Those who are praying, prayer is the highest form of worship. We were just talking about worship the other day, Walt. Prayer is the highest form of worship. Now, I need to make a point here that uh, there's only one person you need to be praying to, and that's God Almighty, our triune God. There are people out there that are praying to other things, and they shouldn't be. And it's a weak excuse to say you're praying with. Weak. Bible very clear on this. It's not, it's not guesswork. It's not a mystery. It specifically speaks of not praying to the dead. Now, granted, I believe Mary is probably in heaven, and so are all the saints, but it doesn't say to pray, pray to them or with them anywhere. God's a jealous God. We often forget to pray. Now I'm going to read from uh, Deuteronomy really quick. You don't have to turn there. 18, uh, 10 through 13. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughters pass through the fire, or that use divination, or observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, a necromancer, for all that do these things an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Stop praying to anything other than that, the triune God. There is one name above all, and that's Jesus Christ. For whosoever shall come upon the name of the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ saves. Not Mary. Now, I, I do need to uh, back up just a second. The word saint is misused and it's been uh, corrupted. Saint simply means believers. It's ideology of somebody who has to die and deemed a saint by an institution is a lie. Saints are believers. That's the way the Bible defines it. That's the way it is. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, and he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Praise God. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sins. Some of you think that you're not dirty, and others know that you are. In either case, pray this particular psalm, Psalm 51. One of my personal favorites, so much so you're going to hear it today. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God. Prayers start out from the Bible with, O oh God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. Thou as mightest be justified while thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. 
Behold, thou dearest, desirest truth, and in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out my, all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltless guiltiness, O God, thou God, my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thy, my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit, and broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall offer bullocks upon thine altar. That is a prayer that I pray often. Those broken burnt bones that are spoken of in that scripture, I pray that as if they're mine. Of course, it's only a bruised bone, but... Nonetheless, the intent is that God is crushed. Sometimes we have to be, to be reformed. There's plenty of Christians out there that are born well into a very godly world. God bless them for that. Some of us are so darn wicked that we have to be walked. And I'm one of them. So I pray this prayer back to God in Psalm 51 because I know the sins of my heart and he knows the sins of my heart and I beg him to take them from me. Verse 8 If we say that we have no sin we deceive other, ourselves and the truth is not in us. The truth is not in us should terrify you. How do we embody Jesus Christ, the one and only true? Paul writes to Philippi, Therefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Truth is not in us. Saying those words and knowing what the truth is, again, should terrify you. Verse 9 and 10, we confess our sins, we are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And the word is not in us. Twice. Truth is not in us and the word is not in us. Christ is not in us. Here we have the expression chino. Christian in name only. There is no reason why you can't give yourself the Romans road. First being of conviction for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. As it is written, there is none righteous, not a one, Romans 3.10. If you pray these things to yourself, reconviction and revival within you can happen. God's will, God's grace and mercy toward us is found in Romans 5.8. But God commanded his love towards us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. Why? Are, are, are we something special? He obviously thinks so. We have done nothing to deserve it. 
Now, confession. I told you that story about Martin Luther before spending five hours of confessional and the bishop he was with told him to go away after he's committed adultery and murder to come back because he's telling him about coveting porridge. Well, God doesn't see anything wrong with this as far as you're confessing that sin. We have to realize how holy God is. So that little white lie that you're not, you're, 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 you're telling somebody, so because you don't want to hurt their feelings, is still an offense to God. Those thoughts in your heart, in your mind, are still an offense to God. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with his mouth confess, confession is made unto salvation. It's Romans 10, 9 through 10. We can confess to God every day we should. There's not a day that goes by that we are sinless. In fact, the suggestion thereof is a sin. But we just made God a liar. There is no reason why you cannot use Scripture to witness to yourself. Scripture can and will be your shepherd in times of need. The enemy has rounded up his troops. He's attacking this little fellowship time and time again. The enemy does not hit your pastor in circumstance. The enemy knows my faith in God carries me. I worry not of these things living under the providence of God. So where does he go to tempt me? In my dreams. I'm plagued regularly with uh, the little sleep that I have with all kinds of horrific things. I'm tempted by the enemy through uh, others all day long with trials and tribulations and sometimes persecution. Persecution doesn't always come from the outside. We've been used through believers who left their armor off. Yes, if you do not remain in prayer, you will let down your guard, and the enemy will and can most certainly use you to tempt other Christians. Do not tell me it can't happen because I've seen it. If you're not in the light of Christ, walking in the light and spirit, if you're not among brethren for fellowship within each other and with God, you're in the dark. I will read that passage from Ephesians with emphasis so that you understand how necessary keeping your guard up against the enemy is. Little things can sneak in there. How many times are you tempted throughout the day? Men are tempted more so than women as far as uh, the lust of the flesh are concerned. Women have a very different attitude towards these things. How many times do you tempt? You have to recommit a covenant with your eyes. How many times have you entertained dirty jokes? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Not just a little bit. Whole thing. That means you have to be in prayer and study regularly. You have to be with brothers and sisters regularly. If it means calling them on the phone and getting with them for coffee, that's not a bad thing. You should be able to reach out to brothers and sisters. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood's easy. You can overpower it with might. But against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Demonic warfare is very real and it affects you in ways that you have no control over unless you are in prayer, unless you are in study, unless you are close to God. 
Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil of the day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Girding the loins, again, I might have talked about this before, the cloak, they're tied up in front so they're ready to run, they're ready to work. Doing the work is so very important. Again, a, another passage of scripture that is, is often misconstrued, faith without works is dead. Well, those works are, are only of believers. If you're attempting to use those works to attain righteousness and, and salvation, it's just not going to work that way. That's only obtained through Jesus Christ alone. But those works are for believers. The believers who are doing nothing will find themselves in a whole world of trouble because they will let that armor down. They will let their guard down. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth. Where is the truth? In the Word of God. Telling you to study your Bible. Having the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. What an amazing gift that is. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of, of the wicked. You know, you can go before the Lord and pray for a double portion. That's a whole other sermon find out in the Old Testament. Remember who it was that prayed for double portion. we we'll talk about that. The praying for a double portion, there's nothing wrong with that. Lord, I need a double portion of faith. Trust. It's easy to lose faith if you're not in prayer and you're walking in darkness. Take on the helmet of salvation. Knowing that you're saved is tremendous. Going into battle, knowing that God has already prepared a place for you, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I love how the Scripture interprets itself. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all preservance and supplication for all saints. You are the saints. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten home from work. Um, my day starts at 1 a.m. Prayer. And often I have to write a paper. And then I'm off to do my, my tent making. I'm usually on the road by 2, 2.30. Do my tent making. And my day doesn't end until anywhere from 5 to 8 o'clock. I get home. I may have a little dinner. Spend time as much as I can with my son and my wife. And I'm off to bed. And I fall before that bed on my knees. And I have no idea what to say because I'm completely exhausted. And I tell God, Lord, you know where I'm at. I'm exhausted. I don't have to say anything. But I want to talk to you, Lord, because I know it's not only something that you require of me. It's something I require of myself and I need it. I've been in the world all day long. I've been amongst all kinds of heathens. There are some mornings I pick a prostitute. And I feel the need to witness to them. Often on deaf ears. Wicked men all kinds of people. I see all kinds of things. But I get before the Lord on my knees before I go to bed and I thank Him for giving me the opportunity 
to glorify Him. And I thank Him for all that He has given, graciously pouring out lavishly upon my home, my family, and my brothers and sisters. Thank Him for another day to serve. And I thank Him for His providence, His endless providence. I want for nothing. I worry about nothing, for the most part. Some things I do worry about. I love my son and my wife dearly, but when they're not in my presence, I ask the Lord to protect them. My daughter, my prodigal daughter, I ask the Lord to hedge her with believers. And then I go and I step boldly before the throne with petitions. Because I know God wants to hear them. He created us fellow. So we would need Him. Don't think that you cannot go before the Lord and appear needy because you are. You have no idea how truly needy you are. Your next breath is not guaranteed. Your heart beating in your chest is a gift of God. So when you go before him and you say, Lord, give me rest that I may wake tomorrow strong and ready. There's nothing wrong with that. Lord, I need this. I need that. Lord, I want you to help with my, my, my brothers and sisters. I want you to do this. Please, Lord, help me. It's okay. Because he's created you to need him. And through that need you worship him and glorify his name because it's all from him. Every good gift is from heaven. Get out of the dark. If you're not with brethren today on the Lord's Day, you're not seeking fellowship with the Lord who is sharpening your iron. I implore you to fall upon your faces in prayer and regain your faith in the Lord. He will deliver you. Every member, part of the whole, when one suffers, so do we all. Heavenly Father, O oh Lord God in heaven, we thank you. We thank you so much for your word. It strengthens our hearts. And I pray that it turns many back to you, those who have strayed. God, we ask for healing, as always, for the McGillory's daughter, Mike Hargrove, Larry Haroon is still recovering from his heart attack. My dear mother, my son, who's been battling that cough, I pray, does not turn into something worse. I give them all up to you, Lord. We know that hand has in back short, and you can provide. You always have and always will. Lord, we thank you for those of you who put in our path to guide this little church. Lord knows I need this, this guidance. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We pray this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ.